So I I pushed, I, I committed and pushed the code that we had. I've been pushing to repos and notes. And I kind of copied over from our notes, like the goals of what we want to do. Because I think this is also a good chance. Like the assessment is a big enough project where you really do have to start organizing your work, whether it's in comments, in another doc, on a piece of paper, you have to start making lists and breaking stuff down and like kind of coming up with your plan of how you're going to build stuff. Um, the, the, the projects are just too big now to try and keep it all in our heads or wing it. Um, so, you know, these are our features and, and we're kind of working on like signing up, right? A user, and to be a little more specific, a user can sign up and create an account. So creating a user account now works. What are the pieces of this feature that are, are missing? There should be a really obvious one. What can the user not do right now with our app? Make an actual username, email, and all that. Yeah, yeah. Like we can create accounts, but no one knows what the account username is. I can't enter in my information. Like it, it's all just hard coded in, in our code right now. All we have is we can create test user one over and over and over. So, and this is, I wanted to walk through this too, to start thinking about how to break stuff down. Like, right, uh, create, um, so there's really two things that we want to be able to do here. Like there's there's two parts to this, like um, user can create account with desired username, email, password. So there's two parts to this. One is user can put stuff in form fields in, right, like an HTML page in the browser, right? Like on the sign up page, there should be, and I need the Python comment. On the sign up page, user should be able to enter username, email, et cetera. Um, what's the other part of that feature? Like, to, to me, what that part describes is if I go into templates and I go to sign up, like there should be, you know, input, uh, what is it, uh, label is, uh, let's just make it uh, username. Let's see if that, email. password. Uh, I'm not sure if I need the input tag there. Let's, let's find out. So server is running, popping over here. Um, what I'm going to do also for the moment in our view method, I am going to, I think, copy or sorry, comment out all of this stuff because otherwise we will just be create trying to create the same user and failing all the time. And we'll come back to that code in a minute. I just want to make sure that my form fields are showing up. And they are, which is great. Now, I wanted, oh, I think instead of label, I needed to use placeholder. Um, There we go, that's what I wanted. So that's one part of our task. And this is really common, like, um,
Like there's the front end task and then there's the back end task. So what are the other pieces to get this feature working that, that need to happen? Like I can put stuff in here. What else needs to happen? I think you're probably gonna have to do a Axios call. Yeah. Um, so that you can, so the button actually does something and you can save it. Yeah, totally. Like we need a user can click sign up button. Button either does form post request or Axios call and sends data to server. Totally. And then on the back end, on the server side, what do we have to do once we get that data? User does save. Yes, there is one step before that that needs to happen. Do we need to check if the user is already there? That's a great call. We can definitely check if the user is already there. Um, before even doing that, and this is maybe too simple a question, like what is the code missing right now between line nine and line 16? Get request. Send the yeah. new user. Get request. Yeah, mainly I, I need to get these values out of the request, right? I need to actually get the username and the email and the password. Like I need something like that looks like this, you know, username equals request, uh, post get username. And I don't know if this is right. But something like that. And then we need to actually use that stuff over here, right? Like username, email, and password. And in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do username equals test three, email equals test three at gmail.com, password equals password one, two, three, because I really like faking data so that my code is in a working state, but we have a couple tasks here, right? We have to to do like confirm this is the right way to get the data from the, the HTTP request. Um, and then, you know, some nice to do's like bonus. Um, check if user already exists. The database actually does that for us. If you folks remember, like we'll get an exception back from the database. So we don't even necessarily have to do that. Um, we probably should like only have this happen in a post request, but even that isn't critical just to get this working, right? Like, like to do, and then maybe like a good next step would be Next step to do um, only create user or post request, not get. But we don't even need to do the post request stuff just to get our code working and to end. Um, so I always think the best way to like test stuff out is to have real data. So because I am on purpose right now being lazy and not remembering exactly how to do this. What I actually wanna do first is let's actually send some data back to the, the front end. So let's throw some stuff in the signup sheet. Um, someone mentioned Axios. I, I'm a fan of using Axios. We could also use a form. Um, truth be told, um, and actually, Really in the layout, I should have a head and I should have a body. 
Um, and the, this stuff should really go in the body. And let me make sure too that I don't have, yep, no body there, so we're good. Um, but Axios is good because, um, and I guess technically we need a title, so we're just going to be like, blog. Axios is good because we're going to use it with React all the time. So it, it is really good to get comfortable using Axios. It also gives us more flexibility, um, even though it's a little bit extra work with redirects and things like that. So in fact, I don't even need to Google Axios CDN. I just need to Google Axios JS and go to getting started and scrolling down. They have the link to the CDN. And I'm just going to throw that in, in the head here. And it probably is better to put it in, in the body, but honestly, it's, it's not the end of the world. And it's also good because we might have some JavaScript in here that's using Axios. Um, so, so that's good. And I'll put a comment, Axios for HTTP requests. And I'm just going to go to my signup page again and hit click to make sure that it's working, which is great. So now we do need to start writing some of our own JavaScript. Um, I actually haven't set that up. Can someone maybe walk me through? I know we have to create a static file. I think we have to touch settings py. Does someone maybe want to, to, to navigate uh, for that process while I drive? Um, Brian, would you be down to, to do that, please? Um, yes. Uh, sorry, uh, could you uh, go over what we're doing again real quick? Totally. So I've got my sign-up page. Um, I want to be able to put in some JavaScript, whether it's uh, like here, script source equals, uh, I don't know, index.js. And I want that JavaScript, we're gonna use Axios to make an HTTP request back to our Django server. So I don't have a static directory. I haven't set up any of my JavaScript stuff yet. I, I have added Axios here, uh, okay. so we'll have it, but I need a little help with the rest. Um, if, uh, well, if you have, uh, couldn't you put your JavaScript link in your layout.html after uh, Axios? Yeah. And then that extends tag will, um, won't that, um, recognize that? Yeah, it, it totally will. Um, okay. You know, we might not want to do that because we might not need to run this JS on every page, but honestly, that's not a bad idea. Um, okay. Yeah. And where do I want to create the static directory to put this index.js file? Um, I believe that is underneath the base project folder, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. And, and thank you, chat, for helping. And I should also mention, um, we haven't really called on people in class as much as we should really. The rule of thumb, and I'll remind people of this, is whenever we call on someone to ask a question, you can always phone a friend. So we're gonna be asking people stuff, but I know like there's a lot to track here and I don't wanna put anyone on the spot. So it's good practice, but you can always um, phone a friend because it's it's a team sport. So Brian, awesome. I've got static. I'll make um, an index.js file there. Um, I'll do console log, hello world. So we can see if it prints out in the terminal or in the browser. Is What's the last step I need to do to maybe link all this stuff up? I'm going to your settings and change the uh, um, static files. Yeah. Um, so right now it's just set to static. Is that? And then I believe below that you do static files underscore durs and then uh, open bracket. And then you put in your base dir. 
Got it. Okay, so that should also be static like so. Uh, base underscore dir and then slash static. Um, outside of the quotes. Oh. And I believe that's supposed to be all caps. I don't know if it's. Yeah. No, I think I, I think you're right. Um. Like, um, I think is static supposed to be in quotes? I believe so. Cool. Chat chat says yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, man, and and thank you, team, and thank you for helping me with that one. I I need a little refactor on that one, and we've got the index.js. And we've got a hello world message. And go back. Go back to settings.py for a second. Yes, sir. Line 122 between static and files, remove the underscore. Static files is one word. Thank you so much, Icarus. Uh, and now it's happy. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. No, this is a pain. To be honest, it's not the worst idea. Like you could just keep an example file that just has like your standard settings that you're always going to have to add to settings py. Because I think there's static files now. There's like auth user model. So that might be one way to tackle this. Because I, I agree, it is a, it, it's a bit of a pain for me. Like if you're not doing it all the time. Um. Let's see if we're working. Um, I'm getting a non-JS module detected message. Let's see what happens in the network tab. Let's see what happens on the home page because this stuff should also be there as as well. Um, So first off, I would have thought that, let's see here. Do you have to run the, the server, Adam? That might help. It looks like it did die. Oh, and changing the static stuff. Yeah, thank you so much. That's, that's a gotcha too, like making changes to settings PY. Okay, so that's awesome. Um, we're not seeing the hello world message. It looks Does like we're getting file HTTP for your HTML. Say that again. Do you link your uh, JS file, your JavaScript in your HTML? You know, I probably did that wrong. Let's see what we did. Um, I did dot slash index. Static. Yeah, should it look like that? You can load static as well. Yeah, that's the other one. Oh, how do I uh, load static? I actually don't know if I'm familiar with that. Up at the top of the page, you put the two brackets with the parent signs and put load static. That is actually awesome. I think you do it at the top of the page. Let's, yeah, I, I I think, let's see if that works and then we'll go from there. Um, so we're loading Axios, we're not loading our index. Let's try it at the top of the page. Though I feel like it's gotta live in this HTML Yeah, Chris. Yeah, Adam, so there's some stuff in the chat. You're gonna have to do the uh the load static, and I would just do it at the top or wherever you want to do it. Um, and then Chris had the way that you're going to actually access that. So uh you're gonna have to do the so I would just start with the load static. 
Load static. Perfect. And then in the uh, head, make a script tag. And it's going to be source equals uh, the same uh, syntax for the static stuff. Yep. There you go. And then you're going to call static. Uh, and then in single quotes, you're going to do slash index.js. Yep. Awesome. Thank you very much. Let's see if that looks right. That all that is inside the double quotes. We've got the escaping with there. Um, let me just do that for sanity. And do I want a space here or should I get rid of that space? No, you want it there. Okay. Thank you. Let's see how we do. Awesome. Thank you very much, guys. Great, great team effort. So now we're cooking. We've got our, our hello world with the index.js um, or main. Yeah, Michael, I feel like that would have worked as well. That's the way that I'm used to doing it, to be honest, is just manually putting in static, though it, it would have to be inside the source attribute of the script tag. Um, I think the next step is like before we even worry about interacting with the form, let's just fake, um, let's just do an Axios post and fake sending a, a, a sign up request. Um, and this is where it's going to be a little funny having this code run on the home page and the sign up page and stuff. But again, for prototyping, that's that's okay. So I'll I'll kick this off. Um, we've got sign up, right? And then what? Someone walk me through the rest of writing this Axios uh, post HTTP request. Maybe. Um, Thomas, do you want to take a crack at it? Sure. Uh, so we're trying to get what the username is that? Yeah, we want to make an HTTP post request to this sign up route and send a username, a password, and an email. Okay. Uh, so inside the Curly brackets, we should do username. Yep. Username, test four, and probably and password. Yeah. 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 And in fact, I'm just going to do this and let's call this um, const user info, right? Password, password. Email test for for at Gmail. And I'm just doing this for, for readability purposes. And now here I can just do this, which to me is a bit easier to read. Um, okay, and then what else do I need uh, to do with Axios to kind of complete this whole process? When we do a um, um a then like a dot then, yep, you got it. Awesome. Dot then, and what do I pass as an argument into dot then? The response. Yep. And what do I do with the response? Um. So then we'll take that. Um. Put it into a, a the. A function, what's the, the equals yeah, big an arrow? An arrow function? Yeah, no, I know the JavaScript is, it's a little wild jumping from the JavaScript to the Python. <laughs> yeah, the dot then takes a, a function. It doesn't have to be an arrow function, by the way. We totally could do this if we wanted to. Um, there are just some reasons why the arrow function is, is considered best practice. Yeah, so the dot then takes a function that we call a callback function. Because when the HTTP request comes back, Axios then calls it when like we're done for our cleanup. And we pass the response in, just like you were saying, as an argument. Um, and I, I say we just print the response and go from there. What do you think? Yeah, sounds good. Awesome. Thank you very much for your help. And now, 
fingers crossed, we should be cooking. And this, by the way, so the method chaining in JavaScript, it doesn't care about uh, spaces. I kind of like writing it this way because I can kind of see the flow, like this goes into this. And then like, if we have another dot then, or like, a, what is it like? A, I think it's a cut dot catch or something. You can kind of see the flow of stuff, which you'll also see with like map and dot filter. Um, but so this now means on, on every page, the home page, the layout page, the sign up page, um, what well, layout isn't really a page, we should be hitting our sign up endpoint. So let me find our server. Let me clear it. And now here, let's just hit here and see what happens. So we got hello world, we got post, we got an error, and we have the uncaught in promise. So stepping back a bit, here's kind of how to analyze this. The first thing that went wrong is something, we made the post request. And if I go here, I can see in the network tab, the post request that I made, we can see the payload, username, email, password. So the fact that this was sent and that we got an error response back tells us that our JavaScript code in the browser is working. And it looks like it's doing what we want because this looks like, like what we expect. And I look through and I see the route here that gets hit. And if I look over here, we see that HTTP request indeed did make it to the server. Um, and then we ran into a problem. And again, just to sort of talk about how to diagnose stuff, this uncaught and promise stuff, this is really an after effect of the first problem. Like we didn't really write any code to handle errors, which is fine. So we can ignore this and this will go away once we fix whatever went wrong on the server side. And over here, this error message is, is, is pretty friendly. At, at the bottom, at least, you call this URL via post, but the URL doesn't end in a slash, and I don't have a pen slash set. Django can't redirect to the slash, blah, 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 blah. And then it actually tells me what to do. Change my form to point to localhost 8000 sign up or set a pen slash false. So I'm going to try, so we're not using a form. Django is just sort of assuming that. Um, we're using Axios. And this is a, a big pain and a common gotcha with Django endpoints. That was Django's very fancy way of telling us that it wants a slash at the end of that for a post request. And we could have done a get request to truth be told. It is good practice. Like if you're creating something in the database, we use a post request to do that. So kind of circling back, I would, this is kind of my flow. I just clear the terminal again and, and clear this and clear the network tab. So it's really easy to see what's going on. And I'm just gonna refresh the page. So we got a different kind of error this time, which is great. And if we look again in Django, there's a forbidden CRSF cookie not set for sign up. And this might ring some bells with people. Um, and can anyone tell me what the issue is there and how to fix it? And I'll kind of give a hint that it's something we have to do to this sign up method here. So you're going to have to put a, uh, a decorator on it. So at CSERF exempt, and you'll have to Im import that as well. Yep. CSERF uh, exempt. If I spelled that correctly, which I hope I did. Um, let me double check CSRF. Uh, I am so used to the job, like VS Code can 
import some stuff. Yeah, it's not quite smart enough to import that one. So let's, you're absolutely correct. Let's go ahead and import that as well. Um, but I, let me do a quick Google here. Django CSER exempts. It should be from, uh, what's it from? Yep, yep, it's in the chat now. Oh, perfect. Thank you. From Django dot use dot decorators dot CSER, which makes a lot of sense actually. Import CSER exempt. Yeah. So there's Django has some restrictions around JavaScript interacting with the server to prevent what's called cross site scripting request forgery. And we'll see later how to set up a token with that and handle that properly, which I think is also handled via cookie under the hood. Uh, for now, using this decorator to just ignore C -surf issues is, is the much faster path. And thank you, folks. So let's see how we're doing. So that's promising. That's exciting. We got stuff back. And if we go look at, I, I think the uh, putting the server in the tabs backfired a little bit. Um, so this stuff, test three is, ah, so this is good. And this is where it's easy to forget too. Like now we have to go change our view code, but we got far, we got, we got the request over to the view. We still have this data hard coded. So let's go ahead and fix that. And can someone remind me, does this look like the right way to get information from a post request in Django? And I am not a hundred percent, so I'm going to quickly Django get post request data. And let's see what the internet says. Request dot post probably, and then we need the, the square brackets and the, um, let's see, it looks like dot get might work because it is um, method. So let's give it a shot. And if it doesn't work, then we'll know that that's the problem. So let's just print the username and let's see if that works. And we'll get to this print statement before all this other stuff. And let me close out some things at the moment that we don't need. So it's a little easier for us to read what's going on. And let's clear this and refresh the page. Let's find our Django server. Um, looks like that wasn't quite right, right? So it probably is something like this. And let's try that again and see if that works. Did I mistype something? Adam, on that example that you had before, um, I, I guess it also passed in an empty string. Do we need that? It's a good question. I would have thought no, but I, I know I would really like someone to maybe just throw this one in the chat because I know that we've been handling post requests in Django. So if someone can maybe navigate me through how to fix this, that would be awesome. Adam, when you're doing the post, uh, uh, the, uh, the Astro post on uh, your JavaScript file, right? Uh, you're, passing, you're passing some data, but where is the data after that? Yeah. So I, I totally forgot 
uh, a step, which is also in the, the lesson for today. Um, and Stanley, thank you for throwing it in there. Um, Yes, let me see if I can get this working and then let's and then let me circle back to your, your question. So I think the step that I forgot that I totally forgot is we sent the data um, in the post request as JSON. So and that data lives in the body of the request. And then I probably need to import the correct module for handling JSON in Python. So that's going to be, let's see here, the Django JSON module. It's just import JSON. Yeah, it's not even Django, perfect. Let's try this again and see if this works. So that does work. We're getting that information printed out there, which is awesome. Stanley, thank you. Um, yeah, folks, have you seen this? Have we done this? Grabbing JSON data from a request from the body of an HTTP request? We've done it, but can you walk through it one more time? Yeah, totally. Um, body dot, give me a sec to, Add these parts in. So, oh, and that should be username. Um, I would say this is a really good example of something that I think if you're looking at this and and are unfamiliar with some of the steps, please like make a note of that. And, and ping me because we should follow up and do like a little group review session on this to just kind of walk through what's going on here. This is the HTTP request coming in. And every HTTP request has headers and then it has a body that has the, the content. Because what we did in our AJAX call over, let me jump over to the static file which will take me a moment. Over here, we used Axios, we made a post request, we sent this object, it gets sent as, as JSON data, which is a little different than if you use like a standard HTML form. So, and I apologize for the jumping around there. So we have to tell our program what format that data is in and how to parse it. And then we grab that data and then we have access to it, essentially like a Python dictionary here. Um, and again, I'd be more than happy to go over that uh, later folks. Um, I think that's a good separate review. Also, this is like, we are doing so much with HTTP requests and request bodies and things like that. Like if there are parts of that that you want to go over more, now is the time to reach out about that so we can do that. Otherwise, I think it will just become more and more confusing as, as time goes on. And I also know that we've kind of moved quickly through certain parts of that in the class. Um, so this week is definitely the, the, the time. Let's see what we have now when we do this. So this runs again, which is great. If we look at the server, we get this user created message, which is great. If I do this again, we get failed to create user because username test for already exists, which is great. And if I do select star from blog app app user, we see that we've got a bunch of users in here. So we're like 75% of the way there. Right, we have um, here we're grabbing, well, we are sending data from the browser to the server. The next step, right, would be get this data from the input fields 
on the sign up page. Um, and let's make a function create user request. I will do a little refactoring and then kind of leave the rest as, as an exercise to the class. And let's pass in user info as an argument. And then call this function when the user clicks the sign up button. So those are the the the, the big pieces. Um, and I do think I, I I dug into that a bit. I, I definitely want to write out, I think the login and and logout code um, because we're almost at lunch. And I think this has been really good, but I do want to make sure to cover some of that stuff. So I think that the easiest way to do that will be to demonstrate the login and write the login code. And maybe what we'll do is we'll go over this a bit more after lunch if people want to do that as well. So we've got this sign up path and we got a lot of this done. Um, I haven't been great about filling this out, um, but I more so wanted to walk through that process. We want to have a login path now with fuse.login and have a login method. Right. And let's go ahead and do a def login request. We know that we'll want this CSER exempt decorator. And we know that we're going to want to render something. Um, I'll just do login dot h. I'll just do, I think, is it called index? For the moment, I'll just return the index dot HTML page, and we can decide later if that makes the most sense or not. Um, to kind of walk through what we want to do here first, check for user info in the request, then see if username, password is correct. If so, log the user in. And so first we have to get that data and we're going to do it the same way that we did before with json.loads because this um, will be taking a, a get request to login. And Again, we can do, I think uh, just, I think we actually want the email if we have our model set up correctly, because we should be using the email as the password field. And we might not have time to test this one before lunch. Uh, the good news is it's, it's pretty straightforward, at least in terms of the, the code that we write, because again, we get to really leverage um, everything that Django gives us. And the key is this authenticate method, which we do want to import from uh, Django contrib auth, I think. And if someone can double check that that's the right import path, that would be awesome. 
And so we use this Django authentication method. And what this does is returns user if username, password are correct. So we can then have an if statement and basically say, and what we're doing here is if the user is valid, we log the user in. If the user is invalid, show error message or something like maybe redirect to the home page. But for now, I'll just leave it as the same and put a to do, do something different than login success case. And then this is going to be, um, we'll just put it in an else. Um, actually, we don't necessarily need the else because we'll have the return statement here in the if. So here we do want to try to log in. And again, this is, Django makes this very friendly to do, which is great. And let me go ahead and I need to import uh, the login method from here as well, I believe. So I'm zooming through the login a little bit. So I do think after lunch might be a good time to go through this. Um, there is, this is also, I'm pretty much following at this point, a lot of the, the tutorial, um, the curriculum lesson from today. So that will be a good guide as, as well. Um, let's see here, I think. Yeah, I think that's pretty decent. We might need another return statement here, but I think it will just fall back to, to this case, which is what we want. Um, we can do, like this would be the very simple way of, of, of doing this, to have multiple kind of return statements of of, of failure cases. And we probably need to import HTTP response from let's see from where does that get imported? Um it should be uh django.http. I was about to ask. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll generally put like anything that's imported from like code that I write, I put at the bottom. Everything from like other libraries, I put at the top. And that's just kind of how I keep life organized. So there is um, a lot of moving pieces here in the login method, but the, the process is relatively straightforward. And it looks like I missed something there and hopefully that is about right basically we need to get the user data from the request um and it's probably sent as json so that's how we're going to grab it and we get the email and the password and then we use django's built-in authenticate method which will check the database and it actually hashes the password to compare it against the hash value in the database and then we need um, a try catch around login because that might fail. And, and if it does, we want to handle that a bit more gracefully than we do here, to be honest. Um, but if the user exists and if we can successfully log them in, then we're good to go and we can return uh, a user homepage. Let's see. 
the logout method is, this is also in the tutorial. Um, it's super simple. So I'm just going to write it right now because I think people will appreciate that and having it in the code. Um, that's really all that needs to happen. And then uh, I'm out and really redirect user somewhere. Usually if someone logs out, we want to redirect them to sign in page or something like that. Um, so again, I think the, the good news is that Django does a lot of this work for us. And then our task now is to start reading a bit and getting comfortable using the built-in Django methods. And also I think getting more familiar with the flow um, of HTTP stuff. And like at some point today too, what might be useful for us to do is to sit down and, and draw out, like, and maybe I can try this with the iPad, like we can draw the flow of HTTP requests back and forth, because I know that I think that's a new thing for a lot of people as well. Um, and again, this is very much what I would do in, in school when learning this stuff. And I know I keep Googling diagrams and showing them stuff like that, but, um, just sitting down and, and like drawing some arrow diagrams is, is honestly, I think, a, a, a huge help for starting to understand this stuff. A lot of these are a bit more. Um, the diagrams show a bit more complex flows. This one, yeah, this is a perfect one where we see that post request that we were talking about with login. Um, in our case, credentials means the request body with the username and password. And this is the login view function that we just wrote. And then the server sends back an HTTP response. And I'm 99% sure that Django will be sending back a cookie when we log in. Um, and then from then on, whenever our browser is making a request to our, our Django server, it's going to include that cookie. And um, Django does a little bit of magic with the cookie to like grab user information from the database and give it to us. And then we kind of can check if the user is logged in and stuff. There are some shorthand methods to help with this as, as well. Um, there are some decorators for instance, like to check if a user is logged in or not. However, especially for learning, I think it's really useful to write out at least a couple of times, like the logic yourself for like how we handle that checking. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a little afternoon, so we should break soon and, um, and, and have lunch, but I just want to check in and, and see what questions uh, people have, especially about this login function, because I know that that one I've moved through a little more quickly. I've got a... I've got a question. Is there a huge difference uh, between getting data from the HTML page uh, through the JavaScript function the way you did versus doing it through a form and calling on a URL to activate a, a views function? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there is not a huge difference. With an HTML form, the data won't be JSON. So we wouldn't do this. Uh, we would do something slightly different to grab the data from the request. Um, with an HTML form, also like the form default behavior is to redirect the user somewhere. So we would have to want that to happen and, and specify where that happens, or we would have to capture that like, the form click event kind of when it bubbles and, and cancel it so that the default redirect behavior um, doesn't occur. And 
I'm trying to think if there are other significant differences. Um, the other difference is, sure, let's see. Yeah, I'm not sure if you can do a form. Yeah, so the other difference is, so there's sort of a convention around when you make a post request and when you make a get request. And the convention is that if you're creating data in the database, you use a post request, like sign up is creating a new user account, right? So that should be a post. Login is not creating a new user account. It's, it's, it's getting information about a user that currently exists. So that should be a get request. And I don't think you can have a form do a get request. And it would still work. Um, that starts to matter more as we sort of like design our own APIs and interact more with third-party APIs. Um, I would say those are the big differences. But if honestly, right now, if, if using a form makes your life easier, I would say go for it. Just understand that, especially as we start working with React, like using Axios and, and working with promises will become more and more common. Um, and we will try to find time to go into depth with both of those things more too, because I know that we covered them a little, not as deeply, and, and it was a little while ago. Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, cool. Let me stop the recording.